Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Very special guest again. I'd like to welcome back a returning champion, Dino Rico, CEO, president of Middlefield, which is personally my go-to when it comes to real estate. Uh, you guys are real estate experts and I'm excited to talk to you about real estate because there's actually a lot of opportunity right now. Dean, how are you? Welcome back to the channel. I'm great. Thanks, Adriano. Thanks for having us back. Yeah, I mean, we're living in some tough times in the real estate market right in canada you see a lot of stuff going on with interest rates and people are talking about bubbles and this and that but today we're really going to focus more on reits because like we'll discuss later on investing in reits is kind of different than physical like buying houses and physical property in canada there's actually some pretty good uh, advantages so let's just start with a market a real estate market update what's going on in the real estate market especially in canada uh currently what's the current market backdrop if you will sure um this has clearly been a market, as you said, that has actually, you know, really not done anything this year. I think the the REIT market in Canada is basically flat. When I look at the S and P 500, it's up 16, 17 percent year to date. Yeah. And TSX is up, you know, closer to about five or six percent. So this market has lagged, and there's a few reasons for that. One, we came into 2023 thinking that the Bank of Canada and the Federal Reserve in the US were done raising interest rates. And in particular, we thought the Bank of Canada was. We knew there were a few more to go in the US. So as a result, you saw some really good performance in January by the Canadian REITs because we thought we had the all clear on the interest rate hikes. Well, that didn't turn out to be the case. And what we've seen is at least another couple of increases by the Bank of Canada since then. And then you also had the banking crisis in the US and anytime mentioned the anyone um, who mentions the regional banking crisis in the U.S., almost in the same sentence, they talked about the impact that's going to have on commercial real estate. So that created some additional negative sentiment. And we're here today, fast forward to September, where we think, number one, that interest rate hiking risk is now basically behind us. We saw the Bank of Canada basically... Uh, choose not to raise last week. Yeah. And um, we think it's likely that the Federal Reserve in the US will not raise this week. So whether we get one more quarter point bump or not, um, we think we're basically at least in the eighth inning, if not at the end of the ball game mm -hmm. on the interest rate hiking cycle. The other factor is the banking crisis. While the banks are certainly more challenged these days, and we're worried about mortgages being renewed at higher rates and the impact that's having. By and large, the banking crisis was really confined to the regional banks in the US and only a handful of regional banks. You also had Credit Suisse in Europe have some challenges. But when I look at our Canadian REITs who primarily borrow from the life codes and the banks in Canada, there are no issues there. Right. So I'm at a point, Adriano, where I think we're in a much better position today with a lot more clarity on some of those risks, which have been a, an overhang on the sector. I think they're now starting to alleviate with much better days ahead. How, how sensitive is the real estate? I know it is, but can you tell me the correlation between interest rates and real estate? Is it is it literally as simple as if interest rates go up hard and fast and quickly, that automatically puts pressure on real estate prices and REIT prices? Is it just as simple as that, Dean? There's, it's, it's a great question. So the impact of interest rates on REITs really comes in two fashions. Number one, from a demand perspective, because what's really been the big issue this year is that with interest rates now going from zero to 5% in a year and a half, investors now say, I can get 5% or more from a, a relatively risk-free instrument like a GIC. Why do right. I need to own a REIT? that is paying me 5% yield, and I'm unsure as to whether the value is going to go up or down. So that's one issue. Um, the other factor is, is that real estate, being uh, a business with contractual revenue streams, typically employs more leverage than the average company. And in Canada, the loan-to-value ratio of our Canadian REITs is typically in that kind of 25 to 45% range. So you're now looking at your borrowing costs going up by virtue of higher interest rates. So that's less cash flow to do other things like, you know, buy more buildings or increase your distributions. So that's how it plays in. And typically what happens when you look at this relationship between interest rates and REIT prices historically, yeah. you typically get a downward move in REIT prices as interest rates go up. 
But then typically 12 to 15 months after rates started going up, you see REIT prices start to recover. Why? Because I think investors conclude or come to the realization that even though rates have gone up, real estate is actually a pretty good hedge against inflation because rates have gone up and that's usually indicative of a stronger economy. And my leases, if I'm a, a REIT, are actually going up as well. And that's exactly what you've seen in 2023, whether it be industrial, whether it be multifamily, whether it be retail, they're renewing leases at you know 10 to 20% higher on average than the lease that was in place. So as a result of that phenomena of revenue growing, even though rates are going up, you start to see a recovery in REIT prices. And that's what we're expecting to start to see now. Beautiful explanation. Makes sense to me. So Dean, straight up here is now a great buying opportunity in the real estate and, and you know, specifically the REIT or Canadian REIT sector right now. Yeah, we really like the opportunity right now, Adriano. As I look at my screen and I see how this sector has really lagged in the face of very strong fundamentals. Like I've basically met with every REIT CEO that we own in the last month and putting aside certain sectors like office. Yeah. Basically they're telling me that their fundamentals is as good as they've seen in the last 10 years, notwithstanding those good fundamentals, which basically mean that rent revenues are going up, their costs have remained under control and their cash flow is going higher. So notwithstanding that positive phenomena, you're still seeing lagging unit prices. Okay. So as a result of all that, we think this opportunity is great. So when you look at REIT trading prices relative to their NAVs, i.e. what we think they're worth, you know, the whole sector is trading at about a 25% discount. That's being skewed higher because the office sector, which is really out of favor, is trading at a 40 and 50% discount to NAV. The areas that we focus on that I mentioned, like industrial and multifamily, they're trading at a 5 to 15% discount to NAV. So they're not as cheap as office, but they still represent great value because when you look at those prices relative to NAV historically, for the most part, they trade at a 5 to 10% premium to NAV, not a 5 to 15% discount to NAV. So short answer to your question, we think the opportunity right now is very attractive. Interesting, interesting. So I talk a lot about NAV versus actual stock price in my video. So I'm, I'm hoping a lot of, you know, most of my viewers watching are I'm gonna understand exactly what you're talking about. So what I've heard is that these these REITs typically five to 10% premium, but now they're like five to 10% at a discount. That's, we're going to zero and then we're going into discount range. So we're talking about like a 20%, they're, they're like 20, 25% off. That's the way I see it. So Dean, thanks for that summary. And I have to share with everyone here, you guys have a phenomenal uh, YouTube channel You've been working at growing it and you do have this video here. I strongly suggest everyone watch it, watch it, watches it. It's 48 minutes, but there's YouTube chapters. You, you could skip to the parts that you want. And in this, you know, Dean, you, you basically summarize the real estate landscape, why it's a good opportunity, what reads middle field like. So there's a lot of great information. So if ever you really want to know what's going on with the REIT sector, I, I strongly suggest you guys check out this video. I will put the link in the video description below and Honestly, Dean, I love when you say I've been talking to all the REIT CEOs. That's exactly what I want to hear from uh, the person who manages my REIT money. So like most people know, the audience knows RS uh, is what I personally have $100,000. And we'll talk a little bit about the middle field products uh, to focus on REITs in a little while. I just also want to show the audience that you actually have the interviews with some REIT CEOs up and running on your website. So you late, lately you uh, met with the guys at Choice Properties which is a really big read in Canada. And you just uploaded, we're talking like two hours ago, where you did an interview with Granite Reed. So this is an industrial uh, read and you, you talked to the, C the CEO there. So interesting stuff, guys. Make sure to subscribe to Middlefield's channel and check out uh, these videos. My opinion, it's well, well worth it. Now, when it comes to uh, Middlefield's products, you have your your flagship ETF, the Middlefield Real Estate Dividend ETF, MREL. I've mentioned it before. I talk about this all the time. It's outperforming things like VRE and XRE, which is the index funds. This is an actively managed REIT. So tell me a little bit about now the, the REITs that you guys are really liking. You kind of already touched, you know, the, the industrial. So um, if we look at, if we scroll down and look at the breakdown, the two top sectors, you know, within the REIT space, multifamily, residential REITs and industrial REITs. 
right? So tell me a little bit, Dean, why you guys are really liking these REITs right now. Sure. So beginning with multifamily, so yeah. these are basically apartment REITs. And there's, a, you know, at the end of the day, you've probably heard me say this before, Adriana, real estate really is a function of supply and demand. So let's yes. talk about supply and demand on multifamily. On the supply side, like we really haven't had any new purpose-built rentals come on in any significant way in 30 or 40 years. There has been some construction over the last four or five years. Much of that is on hold today because of the high cost of land, the high cost of uh, construction, the high cost of labor. Um, uh, one of the positives that we think will incentivize more construction of purpose-built rental properties is the government's announcement last week that it's going to be uh, basically waiving the GST. And I think the provinces are going to follow along with the PST. So the full HST in places like Ontario will now be waived. So that's a significant savings for anybody looking to build a new apartment building. Mm -hmm. Having said all that, the amount of new supply that's come on has been very limited. So that certainly speaks to rising rents. On the demand side of the equation, Canada has the lowest level of housing in the G7. And we also have the highest level of immigration in the G7. Yeah. So in 2022, I think, you know, most people are well aware that we saw about a million new Canadians come into the country, about 40% come into the greater Toronto area. And that was about 500,000 permanent residents and about another 500,000 in the form of for foreign temporary workers, as well as international students. That's a big source of demand for new housing. And we just don't have it. So that's why you're seeing huge uplifts in rental prices because the demand is far outstripping the supply. So at the end of the day, that's really what's driving the significant growth in rental rates. So just to give you an example here in Ontario, the average rent for an apartment building is somewhere around $1,800 a month. And the market rent is closer to $2,500 to $3,000 a month. So yes. Because yeah. we have rent control in Ontario, so for any building that was built prior to November 2018, if I'm a tenant in that building and I choose to stay year after year, the landlord can only increase the rent by about 2.5%. Once I vacate the unit and a new tenant comes in, the landlord can then bring the rent up to the market level. And that's, as I mentioned, going from about $1,800 on average to closer to $3,000. Wow. So I'm, I'm assuming not many people are want to leave the building, right? You got it. So you're supply and demand. Over, There's no so supply. Low. That's exactly right. Your I mean, it makes perfect is a lot sense. Lower. People mm -hmm. are choosing to stay in those units if they can. Now, there are yeah. some reasons why you have to leave. Having a family, you need more space. You go out and, you know, you get a home. But generally, that's what's happening there. So that's why we think the, the factors behind that are good. The other thing I mentioned is that, you know, about a year ago, the federal government was looking at the what they quoted as the financialization of REITs and potentially looking at putting some restrictions on apartment REITs in terms of how they increase their rent. Fortunately, really over the last two weeks, as I've learned from all these CEO meetings I've had, is that the federal government is no longer focused on that. They realize this is a, a, a market where we need more supply and they're trying to incentivize more supply by waiving things like the GST, which got announced last week. So we think that makes everybody feel better about the sector. Okay, so we're talking about residential here. So some of the names that you know that are in your funds, your Boardwalk REIT, Canadian Apartment Properties REIT, Killam Apartment REIT, and you know I've been blown away because I, I actually you know I didn't really do any much research on the individual REITs. I trust you guys with that, but you know these are REITs that have hundreds, if not thousands, of apartments all over Canada. The, the, there's no small fries here. These are big cap REITs that you really you believe in. So you think these REITs are really going to be benefiting benefiting right now with with these increases and, and all that going forward? Yeah, I'd say almost across the board, our Canadian apartment REITs are really doing great. Um, you know, Boardwalk, which is in Alberta, which doesn't have rent controls, not surprisingly, you know, that stock is up over 40% year to date. Uh, Cap REIT, which is really the largest REIT, basically is, you know, effectively coast to coast. It's up by about 16% year to date. But, you know, there are companies like, like Minto, and uh, Interrent, which are basically fat, flat, they're up zero to 5%. We think there's tremendous value 
in some of those companies because they're benefiting from the same things that's occurring at Caffrey as well as Boardwalk. So we think there's excellent value in this space right now. Okay, perfect. It, it, it's not rocket science, right? I mean, it makes sense to me. What about the industrial? This is this is where I'm, I'm, I'm not as familiar as the, the logistical side of these. So you guys, you know, it's a second, you know, 20% of your ETF is in industrial REITs. Of course, we're talking about things like Granite and Dream. Those two are always in the top. Uh, so tell me a little bit about the industrial REITs, why these ones are considered, why you like them, why Middlefield likes them in particular and, and the potential that they could have. So like the apartment REITs, we think they're trading at a significant discount to their NAV. And we think by and large, the NAV is properly reflecting the true value of their assets. And that's important to understand. When these things are trading at a discount premium, you always have to take a deeper look and say, okay, is that NAV really properly reflecting the, the value of those assets? And in the industrials, we believe that to be the case. And again, supply and demand. We know that while there is some supply coming on in the GTA, it's more than being absorbed. The GTA, in fact, is the second largest industrial real estate market in North America. Only Chicago is bigger. So this is a very big market. And um, land's expensive. Construction costs are expensive. So it's, it's difficult to add new supply. But in the meantime, you continue to have companies who are expanding their e-commerce or logistics operations or you've got companies who are looking to onshore some of their inventory management or manufacturing, whereas two to three years ago, pre-COVID, they used to do a lot of that offshore in places like Asia. They're now bringing it back. So there's more demand for industrial properties. And the vacancy in Ontario in places like the GTA is less than 2%. So any new building that comes on, it's being basically let at very attractive rates. So there's a, there's a real positive balance between supply and demand. The area where rental growth is slowing is in the US. In the US, you've had some real increases in supply in various markets. So Granite, for example, has got four properties in the US that are just coming on being completed. And two years ago, those properties would have been let at very attractive rates and relatively quickly. But because there's now more competition for space, um, they're taking a little bit longer to let out, but at the end of the day, they're going to get done at very attractive levels. So rent growth is growing. It's growing at a slower pace than what we saw mm -hmm. two years ago or even a year ago, but still at very healthy levels. And when I look at the valuations of these industrial REITs, we still think they represent excellent value in light of that growth in demand and um, overall slow levels of growth in supply. Yeah, and one thing I noticed right off the bat of your ETF and your 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 real estate split fund is that they're it's mostly uh, concentrated in Canada. I mean, the ETF is seventy five percent Canada, only twenty two percent the U.S. The uh, the the split fund is even higher in Canada. So, um, and you're watching, you guys are watching real estate across not just in Canada but also in the U.S. And you have some U.S. REITs in there as well. So. Um, very interesting. I mean, it's not rocket science. It's the supply and demand. When you think real estate, I always think supply and demand. And it's quite obvious that we don't have enough supply. The demand is high and it's growing both industrial and residential. So that just increases the prices. But now is actually a great opportunity because of the quick interest rate hikes. Now is actually a great time to get in. And once again, to my audience, check out that video where you go through all, all the stats and go through the deck and the presentation. I think it was really, really good. Now, Dean, I have an important question to ask you. Like, this is a question I get all the time. As you know, my channel is all about income oriented investing. The bread and butter is covered calls. Everyone keeps asking me, can you please tell X manager, uh, especially middle field, because they, we know you're a real estate expert. Can you please do a covered call REIT ETF? We discussed this beforehand. Tell me why, uh, what's your thoughts on that straight up? Sure. So we know REITs are basically cash generation vehicles. Um, in my opinion, there's no better uh, company in the market than a REIT that does pays regular and growing levels of distribution, just the nature of their business. So, you know, can we supplement that dividend or distribution out of a REIT by writing calls on it? And in the Canadian market, unlike the U.S., REITs are very, um, they're, they're just less liquid. And as a result, there aren't developed markets in the options market where you can write calls on these. So it becomes uh -huh. a real challenge. Okay. So it's not like, you know, high growth technology stocks or big healthcare businesses. 
that you know have significant amounts of daily trading liquidity that options traders can make markets in those it's much much different in REITs and in particular in the Canadian REITs having said all that you know where I do have some exposure in US REITs so for example in MREL my ETF I actually do have data center REITs and I've got cell tower REITs and those yeah. areas are actually more liquid because they are US listed REITs where you've got greater liquidity. There's more trading volume and you've got more developed option markets there. So it's in those areas where if I chose, I could start writing some options. Now, having said all of that, as you've just heard me describe in the last 10 minutes, we think there is some real value within the REITs today. In other words, if I wrote a call, I'd basically be trading off the potential upside potential in return for income today. And because that upside potential, I believe is so significant, I am hesitant to write calls, even on the US REITs where I'd have the ability to do so. Makes complete sense to me. That That's what I thought. You know, I, it's not the first time I hear that there's much less of an options market on, on, on Canadian stocks. Uh, but thanks for that explanation. Really uh, appreciate that. And but MREL right now is like at a seven plus percent yield. I mean, it's very high yield because it's 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 taken a bit of pressure. And I think there's a great entry point. And you do have RS. So RS, the real estate split core. Personally, you know, disclaimer to everyone: this is my real estate exposure. I have a significant piece in that. So why would you? Why would an investor invest? you think in RS versus MREL. So RS, we're, I'm not gonna get, we're not gonna get into explaining the split fund structure, but in short, it's basically, you know, it has, if we, if we scroll down and, and look at the holdings here, very similar holdings, you know, there's, there's a bit less of them, but you have a lot of the same REITs, the cap REIT is there, Boardwalk, Granite, Dream, I mean, these are big, big positions here. 91 per 92 percent in Canada, the rest in, in the US. So this is much higher yield. This is almost, I think, 11% yield right now, which is absolutely incredible. I've been personally snatching some up, some some shares. So um, why would someone invest in RS versus MREL? Do you, what would you say? Sure. So um, as, you, as, as you alluded, Adriano, the, the RS structure is different than MREL. MREL is basically quite simply just a portfolio of REITs. Yeah. Whereas in RS, uh, we own these REITs that you see here on the screen, yeah. but because of the structure with the preferred share ranking senior to yeah. the class A share. So when you say you're buying RS, you know, you could say I'm either buying the preferred shares or the class A. Personally, I own a lot of the class A, and I think that's what you're doing as well. Yeah, I'm talking about the class A, just to be clear. Yeah. And that's where you're getting that 11% yield. Yes. And you're getting a higher yield there because you're actually got this embedded leverage within the structure, whereas the preferred shares yield closer to 5%. So I can actually borrow money at five and then create this leverage where I have more cash left over to actually pay out to the class A shares. So the class A shares actually uh, pay a higher yield. Having said all that, they carry more risk. Yeah. So unlike a unit in MREL, which doesn't have any leverage, leverage. structure outside of the leverage that within the individual REITs, um, here you actually have leverage in the structure in RS, which then makes those class A shares more volatile. Yes. When you have movement in the underlying portfolio. So in a sense, you're receiving a higher yield to at least partly compensate you for this additional risk you're taking on by virtue of the structure in this split offering. Yeah. When you say risk, it's not, it, it's the same stocks, right? It's not that it's more risk there. They're more riskier REITs. That's not what we're talking about. No. I like personally to use the word volatility instead of risk, more sure. volatility because there's more leverage. So you'll have more price swings on the downside and on the upside. And just to be clear, you're, you're still not writing covered calls because split share funds are synonymous with, you know, very popular that there, people are writing covered calls on. You are still, correct me if I'm wrong here, Dean, not writing any covered calls on RS yet, on any of the REITs, but you do have the ability to do so. That That is correct. Okay. And it's it's a good distinction. There is more volatility by virtue of the structure yes. in the split share offering where in a liquidation scenario, all the cash first goes to pay off the PREF and then whatever's left over goes to pay the equity or the class A share. So that that creates this, different structure, which carries more volatility for your class A investors versus your MREL investors. Yeah. And another thing, you know, for my audience to make sure you check out is the net asset value of RS. So what happens is there's the stock price, which is, I always say, 
is what people think it's worth. And then there's a net asset value of the class A shares with which is the intrinsic value of the class A share. So right now it is trading at a premium, but the premium is not that big. I think it's under 15% here, which means yep. you've got to pay a little bit more than, than what it's actually worth. But I, a question for you, I have to ask, and I, it's hard for me to get a, a straight answer from other split fund managers, either because maybe it's impossible to find. What would you say, how do you figure out what the actual leverage is in terms of percentage in a split fund? Because it's not like a, you know, a covered call ETF with 25% leverage. It's synthetic leverage, it's embedded. And also a great thing about this type of leverage is when interest rates go up, it doesn't impact the leverage of a split share, right? I've heard that from split share funds. So they're, they're fixed interest rates on fixed, the PREF, correct. From the PREF, right? You're borrowing from the PREF, exactly. So the PREF, which resets every five years, right? Correct me if I'm correct. wrong. So, okay, makes sense. So what would you say is the approximate if even possible, leverage ratio of the class A shares right now. It's at 12 and then the, not, the, 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 the preferreds are at 10. Is yeah, there so some way we could calculate that? Yeah, the, the way to calculate it is that you actually just look to the actual structure itself and you say, what is the amount of PREF shares that are actually outstanding? Okay. And then you say, you know, what, what is that amount? And um, I'm just looking to see if I've got it here. I don't have it handy, Adriano. Then what you do is you say, okay, if... I'll give you an example. If there's $40 million of PREF shares outstanding, mm -hmm. the total value of the portfolio is $100 million. That basically means that the amount of leverage within the structure is 40%. Okay. Okay. So what you do is you, you look at um, the, the actual structure itself and say, okay, how many, um, what is the value of the, um, uh, the PREF shares outstanding? Um, and then you say, okay, based on that, so in, in our example, currently, we have about, you know, $60 million in PREF shares outstanding. And then you've got about $75 million in Class A shares outstanding. Okay. So the way you would do the math is that you took your you take your, your 60 and your 75, roughly equal to $135 million. Mm -hmm. You do your 60 over 135, and you say that is the leverage in the structure. So about 44%. Roughly, correct. Okay. Well, Dean, yeah. I learned I learned something important today. I, I want to thank you. It, it's hard to to figure out the leverage, but it's more than as I thought. Uh, and you could kind of tell with the the stock price move, stock price movements. It's more than twenty five percent. I right. was I always tell people it, it's probably near fifty percent. So RS forty four. But then you you know we don't want to get into it now. But there's other split share funds where it could be much 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 higher. So that's correct. So basically, it's kind of like a lever. You're taking, you really are bullish on the real estate recovery on these REITs, and of course, you're taking higher risk and higher volatility, but you could get higher reward, right? That that's just a story of life. So you personally, that's what I like. But if you don't, if you're not comfortable with the structure or the leverage, a synthetic leverage, you could just get the MRL, which, in my opinion, is the number one REIT ETF in Canada. I mean, performance-wise, it pretty much is. Um, and you know, you guys do a great job. You're, you're a real estate expert. So Dean, I want to thank you again for, for coming on the channel. It's always good. I mean, you guys are my go-to for real estate and, uh, I, I see it as a big opportunity. I've been loading up personally on our S share. So thanks again for, uh, thanks again for coming on and to my audience, make sure you check out those YouTube videos. They have a great channel. Subscribe to Middlefield if you want to really stay, keep in touch with what's going on in the real estate and the REIT sector. And Dean, maybe one more question before I leave you. A lot of people, they're kind of hesitant to invest in REITs. They still, you know, because it's the stock market, they they rather buy a house. What would you tell them? What are the big advantages to just buying REITs? I could come up with a million in my head right off the bat, buying REITs instead of actually physically buying buildings and apartment buildings and things like that. Great question. And I get asked those questions all the time as well. Sure. And number one is liquidity. So if I'm going to go out and buy a rental property, whether it be a home or a commercial building, and for whatever reason, I want to liquidate, I just can't turn around and do it that day. Whereas with a REIT, I can do that immediately. You hit sell and that's it. That's it. It's very, very, very um, simple to do um, on the market. Number two is that there's full transparency and these are regulated markets. So these management teams of the REITs, they just can't go out and do whatever they want with these assets. They are highly regulated yeah. uh, by the securities commissions and institutional investors like me keep these management teams honest. We basically meet with them at least quarterly and we give them our ongoing feedback as to how they should be running their business, the types of things we want to see in terms of how their businesses are operated. And that's another check and balance on how they're functioning. 
then there's you know very uh, significant tax advantages on REIT distributions. Um, so uh, REITs also have the ability to diversify um, outside of a specific area. Whereas if I want to make a direct investment in real estate, basically I use my capital and buy a little shopping plaza or I buy a condo unit to rent out. Well, I can take the same amount of money and invest in uh, a portfolio like Middlefields and say, I'm now getting access to not only apartment rental or retail plazas, I got access to senior living. I've got access to data center REITs in the US. So I can get that diversification, which I couldn't do on my own by investing directly in real estate. Yeah. Yeah. Diversification within the real estate sector. You know, I get, I get that all the time because, you know, we sold our condo a while ago, invested all in the stock market. And I, I hear some pretty, you know, after a while, you, it, it's kind of weird. It's quite bizarre. And like, don't you feel like you want to own your own house? Like, is, don't you feel like uh, it's risky not owning your house? I, I feel the it's risky owning one house. Why not own all types of real estate properties all over Canada, all over yeah. the world? That's you know, how I have, feel about it. The other thing I would add is that, you know, many of us are homeowners and while you know the value of your home for a long time just kept on going up, there's also liability associated with that home. Like I'm paying property taxes and I'm paying utilities. Yeah. Um, I'm paying mortgage costs. And typically the mortgage on someone's house is a lot higher than the mortgage or the debt that's sitting on these REITs. So again, there's a very different risk reward trade-off. Um, and I personally just like having my money in these REITs themselves or in a portfolio of REITs like my funds uh, because it, it does provide all those benefits that I don't necessarily get by getting buying real estate directly. Yeah, same here. And rental income, you, you buy a couple of condos, rental income is all taxes, regular income in Canada. Whereas if you buy REITs, you, there, there's, a, there's a big portion that could be capital gains, return of capital. Of course, there's, there probably will be a little bit of regular income. But yeah. as far as I could tell, last, last I checked, it's mostly capital gains and, and, and rock, which is delayed capital gains in my book. So you got how, it. real quick, how, how is it? How are these REITs able to transform it into capital gains? Is it with, you know, buying and selling the disposing of properties and that they could do that? Um, it's primarily from the actual nature of what a REIT is. Okay. And a REIT is basically a very tax advantaged form of paying cash flow to investors. So put differently, when I structure my real estate holdings into a REIT, as long as I pay out 90% or more of the earnings, I don't pay tax at the REIT level, just the investor who receives the distribution or the earnings pays the tax. So it is a way to eliminate double taxation as distinct from a normal corporation, which pays tax on their earnings at the corporate level, then may pay a dividend to investors. And then the investor pays the tax on the dividend. That's double taxation. REITs eliminate tax at the corporate level and they basically pass the distribution on to the investor who pays tax only at that level. And by virtue of paying that cash flow out, you are also flowing through your depreciation to the investors. So for example, Adriano, I if I'm a REIT and I pay out a dollar's worth of cash flow in a distribution to an investor, about half of that is basically non-cash, i.e. it's depreciation, which I flow through to the investor in the form of ROC, ROC. So that's how you basically pass through to the investor the tax advantages that I'm actually getting within the REIT itself. So it's not just your own money coming back to you. It's it's not. In I, fact, I, I keep hearing that and it's always comical to me because that's the technical def definition, but ROC is not just your money coming back to you. It's well, just a fact, tax In fact, the REITs that we own in our portfolio, yeah. we make a point of only uh, focusing on those REITs that actually have payout ratios that after they... Um, incur capital expenditures to maintain the buildings is actually less than 100%, which basically means they are not paying you back your capital. You're actually getting the cash flow that is net of the cost of maintaining the business. And the best quality REITs are doing that. So in fact, you're not getting that. You're getting a return on your capital, not yeah. a return of your capital. Makes sense, Dean. I, I trust you fully, to be honest. You're my real estate guy. I mean, obviously, you know that you've been doing this for a really long time. It's a core competency. And I just want to thank you for the hands-off rental income that this stuff brings in for me every month. And I'm sure other viewers are, are, gonna, are, are thinking of thanking you as well. So Dean, hopefully we'll do this again. Let's follow up and see what's going on in real estate and uh, looking forward to doing this again next time. Take Excellent. care. Thanks, Adriano. Appreciate the support.